Okay, so we are more or less in the middle of the course, and um, we will uh, talk about the uh, well, not 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 the. I mean, at least in this course, the last big uh, item of differential geometry we are going to. Uh, deal with, which is curvature. Okay, <clears throat> so curvature is a simple concept in uh, um, embedded geometry, but uh, when we talk about curvature in R3 for curves and surfaces, we are implicitly using the fact that R3 is not curved, that R3 is flat. It's our reference uh, space and it's supposed to be without any kind of curvature. So at that point, curvature becomes a comparison with, with the ambient. So a, a, a curved surface is has some curvature if it doesn't behave as a linear piece of the same dimension would in R3. When this is a I mean a problem when because you would like to have an intrinsic notion of what means to be curved and not an, only an extrinsic notion. So this is why the, the theorem uh, by Gauss uh, saying that the extrinsic curvature is in fact an intrinsic notion was called the Theorem Egregium because um, it, I mean it has a deep importance. But anyway, we will be just looking at the difficult <laughs> viewpoint, and all in the end will give the not even the interpretation, the formula for the embedded case. Now, uh, I we already talked about parallel transport, but again. Once you have a connection on a manifold, the parallel transport along a curve is the following. If you have a curve gamma that goes from P to Q, for each x P in the tangent uh, space at P, we have a unique vector field x along gamma such that, so a vector field along gamma is a vector field, is, is a map from the interval of the parameters to the tangent uh, bundle such that at T, the, the image is a vector tangent to the point of the curve uh, corresponding to the same parameter. So there is a unique vector field along the curve such that at the starting point of the curve, its vector, it, this vector field is uh, given by the tangent vector we chose, xp, and the derivative in time is always horizontal. So you remember, we define in the tangent to the tangent bundle a horizontal sum bundle. And so the, uh, this is a differential equation. We gave the, uh, the initial data, so it's uniquely defined. The first order differential equation. We gave the initial data, so it's uniquely defined. And this is equivalent to once we have a connection and blah, 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 to the fact that the covariant derivative of x along the vector of velocity of our curve is, z is zero constantly. So e x with respect to the trajectory of our curve, to the tangent vector to our curve at every point, doesn't change obviously on the curve. So even if x were a global vector field, we are only looking at what is, so this, this constantly equal to zero means along the curve, not in the space. So this is parallel transport. Moving a vector along a curve such that with respect to the velocity of the curve, it doesn't change. Then we define that the, mm, the parallel transport from P to Q along gamma of XP equal to X of gamma of B. Mm. Now, 
consider two vector fields, X and Y, defined in around the point P, and take two very small parameters, T and S. Now, gamma 1 is the integral curve from P that starts from P of uh, which direction X, at uh, and it's the integral curve of X that starts from P and goes on for a in time interval 0T. Then you end up at some point, and you go along another curve gamma 2, which is the integral curve of y starting from gamma 1 of t on a time s. Then you, you are at third point, and from there you follow the flow of minus x, so you get an integral curve of minus x from a time t for a time t, and then minus y for a time s. So this is the picture. Maybe let's see if we can. OK. So we start from p. This is xp. And we follow the integral curve up to here for a time t. Now here there will be a, the vector y of gamma 1 of t. And we follow, and there will be the vector field y all around. We follow the integral curve of y for a time s. Then we follow the integral curve of, of minus x, so x would, would be going in this direction, we go in the opposite direction, for a time t. And then we follow the flow of the mm, vector field y for a time x, mi minus y for a time s. So, this path doesn't, in principle, close up. So these are two different points. We want to measure the difference between two, these two points. Hmm? So how, how long, how, how, how much distance is the, there is between these two points? So they don't close up. And I mean, in local coordinates, you would like to call this a parallelogram because you are almost going, but, but anyway. So we choose local coordinates around P, and we write gamma 4 of S, which is the end point here, as a function uh, of X, Y, obviously, T and S. Now, if you uh, compute the Taylor expansion of the coordinates of the end point, you find something like that. I mean, I won't do the computations. I, I will write them down in the notes, just believe me. But the point is that um, the parallel transport equation, what is it? It's uh, is this which in local coordinates is something like that. The IXJ plus gamma J IK Xi. Ah, uh, no. I mean, I, I or K would be the same, but then I need the, so Xk because I already used I there, and here gamma dot I. So you see that uh, it involves the derivatives the, the partial, the, the actual partial derivatives of x i, x j, sorry, and uh, um, why did I write down the parallel transport equation? Ah, no, it, it's even easier than that. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. That doesn't, um, no. At this stage, we don't even need parallel transport. Parallel transport is the next slide. Um, OK.
So we are just following the um, Yes, we are just following the um, the flow. Or the, so you, you just have to write down the, the equation for the flow, directly, which is easier, and then compute this stuff. And you end up with this expression. Now, the four curves close at second order. I mean, they don't really close, but this first order vanishes if and only if you have equality between the two uh, because we are computing the distance between the points that's the, the, the whole stuff uh, that's where the, the, the metric comes anyway if these two um, symbols are equal, which means that the covariant derivative of the connection is torsion-free. So the torsion, which we briefly spoke about, is in fact the mm, second order vanishing of this distance, which is mm, given by this form. I mean, the, uh, it's the comparison between the, mm, the switch partial derivatives, the mm, covariant derivatives and the uh, Lie bracket. Now, once we have uh, these, we could do the, the, the following game. We could uh, um, take a vector field, Z, take its ve tangent vector at P, Parallel transport it along the whole uh, loop and see, um, I mean, let's see at the end what happened. And obviously at the end we won't be comparing it with its value in P, but with its value in Q, but Q and P are very close. They are identical at second order. Hmm? Okay. Now, if there is no torsion, so if the second order of the difference between P and Q vanishes, the difference between the, vec the, the value of the vector field in Q and the parallel transport of the vector field from P to Q along the path depends again only on TS and is given by this terrible formula. Now, mm, it's not really important that uh, it has this aspect. I wanted to write it down because you can compute it, but it's not really, what is important in, is that here there is an expression which glues up when you change coordinates. So it's independent of the coordinates. Surprisingly, you can rewrite this thing as the following. <clears throat> It's the, the, the covariant derivative along x of the covariant derivative along y of z minus the opposite minus the covariant derivative of the commutator. So in a sense is how much the covariant derivatives commute one with the other. Now, the definition. Given a connection, uh, if it's torsionless, so without torsion, the uh, non-commutativity of parallel transport depends at the first non-trivial term from a global object, so something which doesn't have a meaning only in a, in a coordinate chart, but which glues up in, in a global object, which is written in terms not of coordinates, but of global operators, so the covariant derivative, which is called the curvature. So the curvature of the connection is, I'm sorry for that, the field of three linear forms from tangent, tangent, tangent to tangent, uh, which for three vector fields is given 
by these expressions. So it's defined, this is the important thing. As many of the objects we study, it's defined on the point, on the tangent of the point. It makes sense in the tangent space, but the definition comes from a local extension. Then every local extension you take, if they agree at the point, they give you the same object. But in principle, the formula depends on vector fields and not on tangent vectors. But this is a, I mean, a secondary point. So this is the formula, the, the, the part we saw before. The, this is a vector field because these are covariant derivatives of a vector along another vector. So they will give you a vector in the end. So this expression, R of x, y applied to z gives you a vector. So R of x, y is a, a bilinear anti-symmetric form. But anyway, it's trilinear because it's linear in x, in y, and z. In local coordinates, you have the formula we found before, which is terrible. I mean, no one remembers it. Yeah, I mean, no, yes, some people rem do remember it because they work in Riemannian geometry, but it's not very easy to, to remember. It's actually easier to remember this one. It, ma it makes sense. Uh, the curvature measures the effect of switching covariant derivatives up to the correction that you already have from torsion, which is the um, commutator between x and y. So in a sense, we are saying that, I mean, if these were partial derivatives, the usual partial derivatives, these two terms would be equal, and this term would be 0. Because the commutator between two partial derivatives is 0. d in dx and d in dy commute is the Schwarz lemma. And for the same reason, these two uh, covariant derivatives would be 0. That is the flat case. That is when all gammas are 0. Now, the second covariant derivative is this thing. So in, in principle, if you, if you want to, mm, I mean, this is a function of y and z. So if you derive it, you should derive it once in z and once in y. The thing you want to do is to derive this with respect to z. So you derive it, and then you take out the component with respect where you derive in y. This is the, 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 the meaning of this expression. Or if you want, it's just a definition. It's, it's the second covariant derivative. When applied to a function, as opposed to a vector field z, with the levity cheetah connection, the expression above gives the Riemannian Hessian of f, and we know that it's symmetric in x and y. So the Hessian is just uh, for, for a metric compatible uh, connection, the Hessian is just uh, a, a symmetric form. So if z is not a vector field but a function, this is the, just the differential of f along y, and so you get the And this is the differential of f along uh, the mm, nabla x, y. So it's, it's symmetric. In general, it's not. So you can prove that what we did before with the curvature was just compute the non-commutativity of the second covariant derivative. Hmm? Apply to vector field again, because for functions, it's 0. But for vector field, it's not. So you can write down local coordinates that the um, curvature is just this expression here. This is again a vector field. This is a vector field. So this result is a vector field, which depends linearly on x, linearly on y, linearly on z. Now, Riemannian curvature, or the Riemann curvature tensor, which is this R, it's a very complicated object. Uh, for example, it has a number of properties, and I will give you uh, just uh, a four, which uh, actually require, not require, but are, are, are written in a more nice form if we change these uh, um, 
this quantity by defining r of x, y, z, and t as the scalar product between r of x, y, and z, and t. Hmm? This gives you a vector, and you take the scalar product with another vector. Now, written in this form, it has a number of symmetries, which, I, I, I mean, they're not, mm, they're important if you have to do computations in differential geometry. I, I'm writing them down just to uh, show you how complicated the object is. So it's not symmetric. In particular, if you exchange uh, uh, things in a non-sensible way, it, a, a minus signs come out. So if you exchange y and z, y and x, it changes sign. If you exchange z and t, it changes sign. Moreover, if you permute, uh, if you permute uh, yes, cyclically the first three, you have something that sums to zero. If you exchange the first block and the second block of terms, it's symmetric. And if you take covariant derivatives of the first part, so r of x, y is the thing that you have to multiply. So is this part with z free as a variable, you end up with zero. This is the number two is the first Bianchi identity, and number four is the second Bianchi identity. Or this one is also called algebraic Bianchi identity and differential Bianchi identity. Anyway, it has a number of properties. Um, if we will be ever using them, I will just, told, I will just tell you that there are symmetries of the uh, curvature tensor, of the Riemannian curvature. Uh, obviously, if one wants to do computations in, with the curvature, ha one has to remember all these properties. These all can be written in terms of indexes and of uh, switching indices, but I mean, uh, it doesn't clarify things a lot. Now, this is a com very complicated object. It has to be mentioned because uh, it's the uh, core of the theory of curvature, but in practice, in many times, you will use other kinds of curvature. Uh, the original one, which is defined by Riemann, is the sectional curvature. Now, uh, you could think about restricting this weird, uh, complicated field of trilinear forms to curves. But then to curves, you only have one tangent vector, the velocity of the curve. And if you put everything equal inside the Riemann tensor because of the previous um, properties, you get zero. If, you, if too many things are equal, you get zero. So you need at least two independent vector fields to have a non-trivial result. Hmm? Now, take a two-dimensional plane inside the tangent. At a point P, you take a two-dimensional plane inside the tangent space. The sectional curvature of M is the function that for every two-dimensional plane uh, gives you this number, which is the restriction of the uh, four variables version we wrote before of the curvature to an orthonormal basis of the plane. So we take an orthonormal basis of the plane, x and y, and we compute the Riemannian curvature on x, y, x, scalar y. So x, y, x, y. This is the curvature restricted just to that plane. Obviously, you can select for each point on M, there are infinitely many planes, and then you do it for each point of the manifold. Uh, in a way, you could say that you are, if you apply the um, exponential map to this plane, you end up with a surface, a piece of surface instead of M, and you are measuring the Gaussian curvature of that surface. Now, the, this function, if you know it for all planes and all points, gives you back the whole curvature R. And when we talk about the um, constant positive negative curvature of a manifold, we are actually talking about its sectional curvature. It's called sectional because it's along a section, and 
the easiest section you can make that makes sense is a two-dimensional one and not a one-dimensional one. Curves are too small, so we take surfaces. And we measure these curvature along surfaces. Along surfaces, you only have a basis of two vector fields, so the fact that that thing was a, a trilinear field of forms, it, it doesn't matter anymore because they are two vectors. They cannot, and the other combinations are either equal to these or to minus these or zero. If you try to put the vector fields in another order, you either get the same thing or minus the same thing or zero. So this is the, the, the only quantity that you get once you fix a surface inside your, um, your manifold. And for the surface, this is the Gaussian curvature at that point. Okay, if the curvature vanishes, R or K is the same, kappa is the same, the manifold is said to be flat. Hmm? Curves are flat, all curves, and uh, you could write down the product formula for curvature. If you take the product of two curves, it's again flat um, in the product space. So for example, uh, R times S1, which is a cylinder, it's flat, and S1 times S1, which is a torus, is flat in R4 with the induced metric of R4. It's not flat as a revolution surface in R3. Hmm? Now, um, if we fix one of the tangent vectors x and y and we take all other possible choices that give you an orthonormal basis, uh, you get a family of planes that contain the same vector, x, let's say. You could take the mean of this uh, sectional curvature on all these planes which contain all the same vector, in the suitable sense of mean. Uh, this gives you a quadratic form. This gives you something which depends only on one vector in the tangent space, and it's quadratic in that vector. If you remember the formula, the vector x, for example, is here two times. So if you vary y being always orthogonal and with norm 1, orthogonal to x and with norm 1, and you average the expression on all y, so you, the integral of the sphere, blah, 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 you get something which depends quadratically on y. This is a quadratic form on the tangent uh, on the tangent space. You can polarize it. You can write down as a symmetric form, a symmetric bilinear form, and this symmetric bilinear form is called Ricci curvature. So the Ricci curvature at P is the trace of the endomorphism of the tangent space given by V goes to this expression. So this is a, a thing that takes a vector, a tangent vector, and gives you another tangent vector. Because we're applying the curvature, the, the Riemann curvature, with two fixed entries, one variable entry in the trilinear version. So the result is a vector. This is an endomorphism. It makes sense to take its trace, like any linear map from a, a vector space to itself. We can take its trace. In particular, if we take an orthonormal basis, trace is just the product of the map evaluated on the orthonormal basis, scalar, the orthonormal, the same orthonormal, the same vector of the orthonormal basis. So this function on EJ, scalar EJ. In local coordinates, the component of the um, Ricci curvature is, uh, not, is uh, denoted by R E J. Lower indices because it's applied to two tangent vectors, so x i above and y j above. By definition, this component is the Ricci curvature calculated in partial i, partial j. So we have to put here partial i and partial j. 
and we end up doing a summation on all the components of the uh, Riemann curvature with the upper index and the last index equal. Again, it's important that they are not, I mean, you cannot permute the indexes, so it's important which is which. That, that's a terrible thing about uh, uh, Riemannian curvature. I mean, using it, it's, it's, it's terrible because you mess up all this stuff. Anyway, this is a trace, meaning that you are uh, putting equal an upper and a lower index and then implicitly summating over them. The scalar curvature is another mean. I mean, you uh, have the Ricci curvature. You can take the mean of the quadratic form on all directions and you get the scalar curvature, which is the trace of the Ricci curvature. The, the Ricci curvature is a symmetrical linear form, so we can uh, uh, read it as a symmetric endomorphism of the tangent. Its trace is what is called the scalar curvature. Uh, so with respect to an orthogonal basis, it's just the summation over i different from j, just because otherwise it's zero, of the scalar product of the Riemann curvature of a i e i e j times e i scalar e j or which is the same, the sum of all the sectional curvature of the coordinate planes, the planes spanned by two uh, basis vectors. Again, in local coordinates, R, which is the, the, sometimes it's also S. It depends on the text. Scalar curvature, or R as the scalar version of the Riemann curvature, is Gij, Rij. Hmm? This Gij above, is partially for the fact that you take a symmetric bilinear form and you transform it to an endomorphism, so you would need to raise one index, and then you need to sum over the indexes, so in the end you get Gij, Rij. Or written in terms of the Riemannian uh, curvature is this thing. Now, why I mean, uh, the, um, this is a panoramic on the notions of curvature, the main notions of curvature you have on a Riemannian manifold. So, starting point, starting point is the following. Take Let's say it closes up. The error we are doing but closing it up is small. We computed it and it's third order, so we don't care. Now, we take a vector here, Z. Okay, instead of uh, um, taking it all the way back, just to draw it, what I'm going to do is computing the parallel transport along these two sides and then the parallel transport along these two sides. with the idea that this is a, an x, this is given by an x vector field, and this is given by a y vector field. So, so comparing these two parallel transports is the same as comparing the original one with the uh, all-around parallel transport. We get two results that don't coincide. And this difference up to the sign, I mean I didn't or really orient it, is plus or minus actually.
r of x and y applied to z. This is why it's written like that, because you could think of it as a function that takes every vector here at p. Do we have another color? Yes. Well, obviously, this is a... Um, when t and s go to zero, and t and s uh, are the... Mm, are the sides of this parallelogram. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a function, because for every vector z, it gives you another vector which measures the difference between the two parallel transports of z. Hmm? Obviously, when, when you are in the limit. Hmm? But it, it, it makes sense. And obviously... Hmm? Sorry, Samuele, I got lost a bit uh, between uh, the role of uh, x, y, and z. Can you say it again? Uh? Okay. X and y are the directions of the sides of my parallelogram. So I, I'm using x and y to build the curves that uh, draw the parallelogram. If you want, uh, you could say that you're, you are picking up uh, uh, normal coordinates at p, and you are writing uh, the and with the x and y, the, 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 the first and the second coordinate at p. And so you're actually writing down the points, uh, okay, 0, 0, whatever, t, 0, whatever, Um, TS nope. hmm. so up to an error which, if the connection is torsionless, is really small, we are working just on this um, rectangle in local coordinates. Mm -hmm. We should take normal local coordinates. I mean, there, there are some choices to be made, but you can end up with this situation. Okay? And you have this vector field Z. So X and Y, in this case, are... partial 1 and partial 2. Now, uh, again, the errors you're making at, at, uh, at um, at P, okay? Not everywhere. The errors you're making, assuming that there are, there are, mm, these vector fields everywhere, are smaller than the green, uh, the pink uh, difference you get in terms of TNS, as in, in terms of orders of TNS. So now we fixed x and y, and we draw this parallelogram. With if you follow the um, the integral lines. The integral curve doesn't close up, but if you think it closes up, you will be doing an error which is smaller than the first term we are interested in. in, in, in. Hmm? So x and y are the directions, are the, you, I mean, up to an order, you can say that x and y are the 
tangent vectors to the curves we use for parallel transport. So you can approximate the parallel transport along x and y with the solutions of the differential equation of the parallel transport with exactly x and y and not uh, some other terms. Now, we do transport the vector field z along the integral curve of x and then of y, and the reverse, along the integral curve of y and then of x. We end up with two different vec vectors in the end, and their difference is proportional to um, well, this term times ts. It's a function of, of, uh, of T and S, so it's proportional to this term times Ts. So the curvature measures uh, how much taking to different paths, how, how much the order of the, um, of the vector fields influences the parallel transport. In the flat case, it doesn't. But, in general, it does. I mean, it changes if you... Uh, okay, this is a very... probably stupid thing. Oh, a very elementary manifestation of this fact uh, is uh, the existence on the sphere of um, triangles with three right angles. Th so that means that if you keep turning uh, in your local reference frame, if you keep turning left, you end up, after three times, you end up at the same point. Okay? So that means that if two people start from the same point and go in, uh, one goes in, in a direction and the other one goes in, in the direction which is left for the first one, and they turn uh, in the right way, they won't meet up at the end. Hmm? Obviously, in, uh, in the, um, let's say, in a, uh, if you look at it on a hemisphere, it's terrible because they miss each other a lot uh, for, for a lot of distance. But if you look at it infinitesimally, they miss each other for a measure which gives you the curvature of the sphere. Now, in this sense, this, obj this object we defined is uh, a, this object we define here, R, is uh, a map given x and y is a map from the tangent space at P in the limit to the tangent space at P. So for every vector z, it gives you another vector, which is R of x, y applied to z. This is why it's written in this form. Then, obviously, a sensible way to measure the difference between those two is to take the scalar product. So you take the scalar product of uh, uh, y. Well, because this, uh, this increment, if, if you think a bit about it, when you, uh, also what happens with the curves, when you derive the, the tangent vector to a curve, you obtain something which is normal to the curve. So this variation of z will be sort of meaningful only when projected on z itself. So you take the scalar product between the variation of the vector field z and z itself, and you obtain the other version of uh, uh, the, um, the curvature, which is the... scalar product version. Ah, ha, ha, what I'm writing. which is a scalar product between the vector you obtain by moving z in two different ways and calculating the difference, and any other vector t. So you measure this uh, uh, change 
this, this um, non-commutativity, the this difference between the two paths, by projecting it on every other vector. Hmm? Okay, anyway, this is a... Um, I mean, this has a geometric meaning, but it's very hard to see it in practice. So that's why people introduce other kinds of curvature, which are uh, this um, sectional curvature, which, is, which can be thought of as the Gaussian curvature of a, a surface passing through P, the Ricci curvature, and the scalar curvature. Now, okay, I need another... Now, just a, a couple of words. I won't be mm, too precise about that. Scalar curvature. Now, scalar curvature and Ricci curvature have geometric interpretations. How? Well. Consider your surface, your manifold, sorry. And the tangent plane in what point? This is P, this is TPM. Now, uh, you can consider a, uh, a circle of radius t, uh, or radius r, so the set of vector fields, xp, which have a norm with respect to your matrix g, less than r, a given number. And you can project, uh, you, you can use the, um, if r is very small, you can use the uh, exponential map to bring it down on some uh, on some open neighborhood of p. So this is exp p. of the blue ball, because I said circle, but it's a ball if you are in more than two dimensions. Hmm? So it's, it's the, the, the set of vector fields which have norm less than r, and you use the exponential map to go down. Now, we didn't uh, really dig in that, but given a metric, you can calculate the volumes. Um, simply by integrating uh, in local coordinates, the well, the square root of the determinant. So, well, let's write it. The volume of some open set U in local coordinates it is the integral on U of the square root of the determinant of the matrix J J. in local coordinates, so the x1, uh, the xk. Which exists all over you. If you want to take the, to, to calculate the volume of something bigger, you just cover it with uh, a coordinate patches. But anyway, you, you can define a volume. Now, uh, you could calculate the uh, ratio between the volume of the green, uh, let's, let's call it XP ball, uh, 
over the volume of the um, ball in the tangent, uh, uh, in tangent space, which is just r to the k times a constant which depends on k. Mm? Now, surprisingly, you can um, expand this, this function in R, and you get 1 minus the numerical constant, which I don't remember, let's say alpha k, times R of P, times the square plus a reminder. So, the volume of the X ball is asymptotic to the volume of the uh, ball in a tangent, and the error you do is a second um, degree error, which is proportional to the uh, scalar curvature in P. The uh, Ricci curvature is the same thing when you do volumes of cones and not of a, sp of a sphere. So you take a cone with a small angle around the vector, you send the angle to zero and the length of the vector to zero, and the ratio between that and the tangent space cone is uh, 1 minus the Ricci curvature at v times r squared. But anyway, so in this sense, curvature is how far you are from being flat because it's the, it's the difference that the curvature makes on the volumes, for example. Now, one last word. If you have an embedded sum manifold inside a, a bigger one, M bar, think about M bar like being Rn, you can define a metric on the smaller one just by restricting the big metric. So you have tangent vectors to the, to the submanifold, their scalar product on the submanifold is just their scalar product in the big manifold. If you have connections compatible with the derivative, the difference between the two connections, the two covariant derivatives, one in the ambient and one along M, is called second fundamental form. And it gives vectors of the normal bundle of M. you can compare, for the ratio connections, the uh, curvatures, and you get this formula, which is the Gauss formula. So the curvature of the ambient space is the curvature of the submanifold plus two terms, which depend on the second fundamental form. Moreover, the orthogonal comp Now, uh, these vector fields are tangent to the submanifold. The orthogonal component of the ambient curvature is given by the covariant derivatives of the second fundamental form. And these equations allow to recover the behavior of the ambient curvature along M from the curvature of M itself and the second fundamental form. So if you know how M curves and how it's embedded inside the big space, you know how the big space curves along M. In particular, in the case of... Uh, uh, Rn, Rn is flat, so the, all the barred terms are zero, and this gives you nice expression that link the um, uh, curvature of M with its uh, second fundamental form, which tells you more or less how the normal mm, direction varies. And uh, I think that's more than enough. These parts, I mean, I, I, I'm not really interested in, in the formulas. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you that you have formulas relating what happens on a submanifold with what happens on the big manifold, and the relation is given by this second fundamental form that actually describes uh, um, how the normal vectors to M vary along M. And I think that's more than enough.